more and more keen on moths. And I hope I'll be able to excite you by the moths uh, in this presentation. Um, as we know, uh, flowering meadows are in decline, and invertebrates are in decline, and that is especially true of moths of the meadow. Um, I won't go through all the data, but if we look at the, the data from the Devon Moth database, the biggest declines have been in moths of the meadow. So I thought, well, what should I show throughout this presentation? What I want to do is to just go through the sort of species that you will probably see in your meadows. However, in doing that, I, I've, that's my first failure. Because last night, I put out a couple of moth traps. Um, we don't hurt moths, they will have been released, or when you've seen them later on, those will be released as well. And um, quite a good catch, but especially there were around about 300 cold swifts. Think back to what Matt was saying about the pupae we found in the ground. And um, the larvae do feed on grass roots. And that's one lot I didn't include in this presentation, so from the outset, I did my failure and I should have put that in, but we'll see some uh, later on. Um, so, just a quick summary of um, a bit of background to moths. Um, some people are surprised by the number of species. So in the UK, more than, more than two and a half thousand moth species. Um, about a third of those are macro moths. Um, I won't go into the detail between macro and micro, but essentially, surprisingly, micro moths are smaller and macro moths are bigger. That's not always true, but uh, we'll talk about that later on. In Devon, in the database, we've got about uh, 1,700 plus moth species. And again, about a third of those are macro moths. Um, looking at the size, huge variation in size, macro moths wingspan from a fairly tiny 60 millimetres up to the tremendous convolvulus hawk moth that's 120 millimetres. Oh and then the UK's smallest micro moth has a wingspan of just 3 millimetres, uh, Entuca acetosae. So those three are that, that pictured there. And one of the things I find fascinating is that different species fly throughout the year. So you can sort of follow the seasons and, and the weather throughout the, the 12 months. And at the bottom, don't worry about the detail too much, but this represents week 1 through to 52. And that peak there is records for the elephant hawk moth. So, very much a summer species. The green ones starting late in the year and carrying on into the new year and then tailing off. Um, that is the winter moth. And so, in between so hundreds of different ones throughout the year. <coughs> that I find especially fascinating. Um, so, I um, asked Lynn to give me what are the top 10 wildflowers that you would see in meadows or recommend for meadows. And these are the 10 that she gave me. So, and what I've then done um, is to look at the number of macro moths in this case that feed on those plants. And these are the species. And you can see that some are very, very good. For example, common birds like trefoil and yarrow. Others not so good. So, yellow rattle, only two species. However, don't be disheartened. Because of course, as we said, um, their, their performance for, for pollinators um, and other species apart from just moths is absolutely tremendous. So what I'll do is I'll go through some of these to show you the moths and talking about them a bit. So a couple of uh, common moths on birds got trefoil. So we've actually got, um, you know, I haven't got one of those, um, but the six spot burn it you'll see flying quite a bit, it's day flying, and what that will do is um, it will form not just um, a, a pupa, but it will also um, make a cocoon from silk. So um, it will climb up the stem of the plant, um, it will build this cocoon, and then inside that it will pupate. So when it emerges, it leaves the cocoon behind. And so quite often, as you're walking around the meadow, you'll see these little cocoons on stems of plants or grasses, and that is almost certainly the five or six spot burn it moth. Um, the oak egger, 
quite a big moth, up to 75 millimetres. That is polyphagous, in other words, it doesn't just eat one species of plant. Uh, its food plants are, are quite varied, or honeysuckle, or bramble, up on the moor it can be bilberry or heather, so up quite a wide range of, of different foods. Um, and both of those actually overwinter as larvae, because um, dependent upon the moth species, they can overwinter as the adult, as the, the larva, the pupa, or the egg, so a huge variation in the life cycle. Looking at yarrow, um, four moths here. So the cinnabar on the right, I do have one of those that turned up last night, so I can show that to you. Again, that's uh, day flying, and you may well know that from its larvae feeding on ragwort, which you quite often see the black and yellow striped ones. Uh, the coloration is sort of a warning symbol. Uh, they contain poisons which could <coughs> impact birds. Um, top left is the, the common pug. Um, I have a, a special liking for pug moths. There are about 50 different species in the UK. They all, apart from one or two, all hold the wings out like that. They're quite small moths. They lie flat against the surface they're resting on. Um, that's a common pug. Interestingly, I didn't catch any pugs last night at all in the meadows here. But um, my desire is to see a netted pug, which is a beautiful moth. Um, Maybe soon I'll see one. <laughs> <laughs> um, the bottom, oh, those two actually, they um, both overwinter as pupae. The bottom two overwinter as larvae. So the model beauty just starting to fly at the moment. Um, that again um, is polyphagous, it feeds on a variety of uh, woody plants as well as on the arrow. And the silver ground carpet, so again, we had two or three of those last night. Um, that flies mainly at night, but it's one of these moths, as you're walking through a meadow, it's quite easily disturbed. So you may quite well see one flying around. Um, so, as I say, on yarrow, but also things like cleavers, uh, various bed straws, cowslip, and so on. Um, the litmus, top left, feeds on sea capsules of campions. Um, so, I saw a picture of the campion earlier on. Um, again, they're flying at the moment. Now, there is a similar species called a champion, and that's a very similar pattern, but it's sort of more purpley, pinky tinge to it. Uh, on the, the right, uh, the grass rivulet. Um, actually, I have to thank Barry Henwood, who's a Canterbury corver. He provided some of these photos for me. Uh, he's very much into the larvae of moths, so that is. Um, a picture of a, a grass rivulet larva feeding on the seeds of yellow rattle, one of the two macro species that were listed earlier on. The speckled yellow, um, again it's a, a day flyer, um, beautiful little moth, and I know many of you hate bracken, just want to get rid of it, but if you do, think of the brown silver line. Its larvae do feed on bracken, and again, this is one that can be disturbed very easily to walk through the field. You'll see this thing flying around, flitting around quite quickly. Um, and again, they're out at the moment. <coughs> On the left, there are quite a few yellow underwings of various sorts. This is the small yellow underwing. Um, I've got a large yellow underwing last night. I almost didn't include this because that, in theory, um, prefers calcareous grassland, uh, and it feeds on seeds of mouse here. But I was speaking to somebody earlier on there, and uh, they were saying that uh, they in fact have recently seen in their meadow a small yellow underwing. Um, so, obviously it does travel to more acidic environments as well. Uh, on the right, um, red sawgrass. This is one species that overwinters as an adult. Uh, again, polyphagous, quite large. 50 to 57 millimetres. Um, that, that's the, the larva, which is actually quite cryptic. I mean, it's sort of green, lying out, stretched uh, along the, uh, <coughs> the, the brush or the sedge or whatever. Um, and so you wouldn't necessarily see that unless you were really focusing on looking for that species. 
So they were sort of non-grass food plants, but what about the meadow grass food plants? So I um, looked at the book, um, which is uh, The Blooming Lawn by Yvette Werner, um, looking for the sort of commonest uh, grasses, if you like. I'm really focused on the list on the left rather than on the right. Um, this just describes sort of habitat neutral acidic calcareous and so on. And there again, on the right there, the number of macro moth species. So you can see that Coxfoot is really very, very good for macro moths. And here are some of them. Um, Model Miner, had a few of those last night, and you can see the sort of the, the, the damage, but the result of the larva chewing the grass. And quite characteristic is that sort of little dead stem coming up the centre of it. There's a, the larva, and there is the, the adult. It's quite a small moth, but rather pretty nonetheless. Um, Cloudy border brindle, rather larger. That feeds on a variety of, of grasses. Um, and again, I didn't have one last night, but in my garden recently I've had quite a few of those. The Drinker, um, rather a nice name. This, this, is, this shows us all the life cycle, so the eggs, the, eggs, the early instar of the larva, uh, a mature larva, and then there's the adult. And quite often you actually see these just meandering around uh, on footpaths out in the open, um, loved by cuckoos, who of course like their furry caterpillars. Um, <coughs> up on walls quite a bit. Um, and it's uh, quite a huge, chunky moth. Um, if they fly into you, they do it with quite a bang if you're around the track. Oh, yeah. And uh, light arches. Um, again, feet on various grasses. Well, I've talked mainly about macro moths so far, but what about micro moths? And there's a, a, a group called the Coleophoridae. Um, these are all actually very, very tiny ones, just a few millimetres long. You can see yeah, about 3 to 11 millimetres wing length, uh, over 100 species. And the problem is, for identification, most of them look very, very similar. Um, in fact, many people don't even bother to try and separate the adults because they are so similar. However, the larvae, uh, most of the time, can be distinguished by their behaviour. And what they do is they construct uh, uh, cases. So the larva uh, will sit in the case and so meander around munching on its food plant. So for example, um, the Coleophora lutaria, the food plant is stitchwort. It actually uses a seed capsule from the stitchwort as a sort of protective case. And so it, it backs into that case and moves around on the food plant. Um, the Coleophora artidipanella. Sorry about the scientific names. Um, most micromoths don't have common names or vernacular names. Uh, that feeds on woodrush, and again you can see the little case. And all these cases are actually quite descriptive <coughs> of the food plant of what the, uh, the, the micromoth species is. Um, other behaviours of micromoths. So there's a quite a few leaf miners, and here you can see one called Trifercula urina, um, on devil's bit scabious, and the leaf miners, they actually go between the upper and lower epidermis of the leaves, um, and, and munch in there. What this one does is it actually starts off with a, um, a mine, which sort of trails around, those black lines are actually the frass, or the droppings of, of the caterpillar, the larva, inside the leaf, then when it's finished doing this sort of line around like that, and opens it up and sort of starts mining throughout the entire leaf. Um, another group, um, the long haul moths, uh, that's Kutchas Rufu Marshala, um, one of the long haul moths <coughs> feeding on cuckoo flower and garlic mustard. Quite often, of course, um, as you walk through the meadow, you'll discern lots of micro moths, um, which at first glance do look very similar. 
Um, but quite often by the food plants or looking closely, you can determine what the species is. For example, again, rushes, um, many of you, including myself, try to remove these. They can be a bit invasive, of course. Um, but uh, as you walk through rushes, quite often maybe hundreds of micro moths will emerge. And these are almost certainly Bactrolancia lana, which are flying at the moment. Um, the grass moths, um, there's a sort of colloquial term, grass moths, which encompasses quite a few species. Um, Agrifana straminella is um, just about to start flying, um, probably in a few weeks' time. The, the dates I've put here are sort of approximate, but of course, um, <coughs> depending upon your microclimate, depending upon the, uh, the weather uh, this year, exactly when they start flying will vary. But um, you can see that uh, the patterns, if you look closely, do vary. That one is actually distinguished by not having a pattern, but being actually quite a bright white. So, um, do you want to monitor your own meadow? I hope so. <laughs> um, and I'll be able to talk to you um, when I'm showing off the moths uh, later on in the workshops, uh, talk to you in more detail about this. As I mentioned, um, moth traps, um, they don't harm the moths. Basically, they have a, a, a bright light which is high in ultraviolet. Um, the moths are attracted to that. They go down into the trap and there's a mechanism to stop them escaping. And normally, you'd have uh, quite a few egg boxes, not the plastic ones, but the sort of paper ones down in there, which they quite like hiding in the nooks and crevices and clinging onto, onto the paper. Um, so at night, I just tend to leave mine running overnight, as I did here. There's one through the gate over there behind the, the building and one up in the meadow over there. Um, leave them overnight, go to the next morning and see what the catch is. And it's a bit like... Do you know what Christmas was like when you were about nine years old? <laughs> you go down excitedly, that's Christmas for me. I do that every time I go down to see my mother's child. She's several times a week, so... Um, Every day is Christmas for me. <laughs> <laughs> also, I could join the day just a sweet net. Um, or maybe in the early evening when it's just starting to get a bit gloomy. Just uh, going out the sweet net, seeing what you can find. And again, quite often you'll find moths that maybe won't come to the moth trap. In terms of materials, um, I've actually got those three books with me today, so we'll look through those. Those are the main ones I use. One on uh, macro moths, micro moths which are based upon drawings um, by Richard Williamson, superb drawings, but that complemented by a book with photography in it, which uh, I think works very well. And then in terms of websites, ukmoths.org and ukleps.org are both very, very useful as well. If you want to find out more, get more involved, um, go on some moth trapping evenings, then the Devon Moth Group is the place. Um, we have several indoor meetings in Ken, um, just off the A38 uh, on the west side of Exeter. Um, three of those a year, and various field meetings where moth traps are set up. Um, there are people expert on the moths so they can identify them. And so feel free to go along. Uh, the next one coming up is New England Wood, which of course is a Devon Wildlife Trust site, um, which is not far from where I live. So that's a Friday, the 14th of June. But if you go to um, the website, deadmoths.org.uk, there will be details of the indoor meetings, the field meetings, and the ball. And I thought I'd finish with that because it's beautiful, isn't it? How can you not fall in love with something like that? <laughs> 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 it's, it's a, a, a Muslim moth, but not even when we see it. You'll see one later on. Um, and you might think, that's nice, it's not that exciting. But you take a little look at its face. <laughs> 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 look at all that fluffy hair. Look at the brilliant colours. I mean, it's absolutely fantastic. Isn't it? <coughs> and that's one of the reasons why I love moths. Mm. So thank you very much. <laughs>